Hello and welcome to you, Young Adults and Youth Sunday School Lesson Number 12. We're talking about the Ministry of Mentors. I'm sure we've all had mentors at one point or the other, but it's interesting to see mentorship as a ministry and to know that it's something to be taken seriously, both on the part of the mentor as well as the part of the mentee. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege to study at your feet. Holy Spirit, please guide us. Father, Lord, lead us to good mentors and make us good mentors ourselves and good mentees for those of us who still have mentors. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Ministry of Mentors. We'll start with the Bible passage, which is 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So that is Apostle Paul, a mentor to Timothy. And he was saying, these are what you have learned from me. I want you to also imbibe and teach others. So Paul must have been very confident about what he taught, what he imparted on Timothy for him to say, go and teach other people so that those ones can teach or, or others also. So Paul is one example of a mentor to Timothy. Our memory verse is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. It says, For though we might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul was saying to the church in Corinth that I am your father, I'm your spiritual father. I have begotten you, I am your spiritual mentor. I have been responsible for building you up through the grace of God to where you are today. You may have read many books, you may have been taught by many, but I stand in the place of a mentor to you as a church. And the, in the New Living Translation, that passage says, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So Paul preached the good news to the church in Corinth, and he was confident that by virtue of that, he was their spiritual father. He was their mentor. So let's look at what that word means. Who is a mentor? A mentor is a trusted counselor, a guide, someone who you can trust to give you good direction, good counsel, good insight into things. A mentor is a person who gives a younger or less experienced person help and advice over a period of time. A mentor is an experienced and trusted advisor, a tutor, or a coach. The word I want you to note there is trust, someone you can rely on. If, you, if a mentor is not trustworthy, then he or she is not worthy of that title. Someone you can someone whose advice comes from sound knowledge and sound grounding, especially for spiritual mentors, sound grounding in the word of God. And the mentee, the person who is mentored, is usually younger in age or in experience. Sometimes your mentor is not much older than you, but he or she has seen and experienced things far greater than what you have experienced. So you, you can, as a mentee, you can be mentored in your place of work, at school, in your church, in your ministry, in your family. There are various scenarios in which we can have mentors. And I pray that as many as are humble enough will recognize the need for mentors and embrace such in the name of Jesus. There's an example that of Moses and his father-in-law in Exodus 18, 17 to 21. Exodus 18, 17 to 21 says, So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel. And God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the, from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them 
to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Moses' father-in-law Jethro had come to visit, he came to the camp of the Israelites, and he observed how Moses handled the day-to-day -day affairs of the people. I said, you're going to wear yourself out because you're there sitting from day, from morning till evening, and people are coming to you with their cases, with their problems. You're going to wear yourself out. He said, the way you're going about it is not right. So Jethro was being a counselor, was being a mentor to Moses. He advised him on how to delegate. Take on the very difficult cases that you'll take before God, but the minor cases you can teach others who will be judges, who will watch over those minor cases. Just like we read in our text, um, Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, Paul said, the things that you have learned from me, teach, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, teach to others also, who will also teach. Teach some men, and those ones will teach others. So Paul was telling, um, Jethro was telling Moses, train some people who were able to take on some of these tasks. So that was actually um, Jethro teaching Moses how to delegate. Jethro was being a mentor to Moses. The ministry of a mentor is an active office for someone who is intentionally committed to raising those who aspire to be guided by them into becoming whom God has wired them to be. So being a mentor is actually a ministry. You are committed to seeing these people who look up to you. You want to see them come into their own. You want to see them mature and be who God wants them to be. Now, there's a scarcity of genuine mentors everywhere. Remember we said the key word there in the definition of mentor is trusted. There's a scarcity of trusted, genuine mentors everywhere. So it's important for us to understand what mentorship is, to understand what to look for in a mentor, and to understand how to access mentorship. We have two outlines today. The first one talks about the purpose of mentorship and the common mistakes that occur in that mentor-mentee relationship. And then the second lesson talks about how to access mentors, accessing mentors. We'll start with the first lesson, which talks about the purpose of mentorship and common mistakes that occur. What is mentorship? We talked about that. Mentorship is a relationship involving two individuals where one serves as a mentor and the other as the mentee. That is, one gives counsel and advice, the other receives counsel and advice. So, for example, Jethro and Moses, we saw that in the text we read earlier, um, Exodus 18, and Elijah and Elisha. In Exodus 18:20, it says, And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. So, unburden yourself. Delegate your duties to trusted people that you have trained. Now, those people that were trained by Moses are his mentees. And when those people train others, they become mentors and the people they have trained become mentees. In fact, 1 Kings 19 verse 16, we see the story, the case of Elijah and Elisha. 1 Kings 19 verse 16 says, Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. In other words, groom your successor. So mentorship is also about grooming successors. God instructed Elijah to groom Elisha as his successors. How many of us leaders, managers, supervisors are humble enough and far-sighted enough to see that we need successors? We need to delegate. So groom them, train them. We talked about who a mentor is. A mentee, on the other hand, that is the person who is mentored, is an individual who has submitted to, to, to the tutelage of a mentor to learn from his or her vast areas of insight and experience. It takes humility to submit to someone else's tutelage. You have willingly brought yourself under the tutelage, under the care. You've accepted to, you've agreed to accept the counsel and advice that this person gives you. Why? Because you trust that he has a lot of experience, he has a lot of insight, and he has a lot to teach him. In Acts 22, verse 3, Paul was saying, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's laws, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. Paul was saying, I too have been a mentee. Gamaliel was my mentor. I sat at his feet and learned from him. Gamaliel was a Pharisee and he brought up Paul, Saul as he was called then. He brought him up. 
He taught him, he mentored him. Now, while it is good to be mentored by an experienced individual, the purpose of the mentorship should be well understood. In the case of Elijah and Elisha that we read earlier, 1 Kings 19 verse 16 was actually a succession plan. So the people that you train, that you mentor, you're not really want, you're not looking for them to take over from you because you might be on different paths. But you should understand why you're mentoring. Elijah understood that he was mentoring this person. Elijah, uh, Elijah understood that he was mentoring Elisha to take over from him. So that's the purpose of that particular mentorship. But there are others. Timothy that Paul was mentoring was not really going to take over from Paul. He was going to be able to stand on his own as a bishop, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a man of God. So John Gamaliel mentored uh, Saul, but Saul wasn't going to become, well, he was on his way. He was a very active, uh, effective Pharisee, but that wasn't where he ended up. And Gamaliel wasn't hoping to replace himself by Saul. So the purpose for that mentorship must be understood, just like the case of Elijah and Elisha. What else? What is the purpose of mentorship? It is meant to get, bridge the gap in knowledge existing in the sphere of life. So you have this person who is very experienced, who is very knowledgeable, and there are people who are less experienced. So to bridge that gap, the mentor must be willing to impart knowledge and share experience with the less experienced one. So you bridge the knowledge gap. It's also meant to maintain a certain ordinance that has been in existence. Maybe there's a rule, there's a practice, there's a process. In order for you to maintain that and keep it going, you need to train people to be able to maintain. Just like Moses and the children of Israel, they, God had given them commandments. And for them to maintain those commandments, the, Moses needs to ensure that those who are taking over from him, the younger people, those who are handling minor cases, also understood the commandments. So you maintain a certain audience that has been in existence and ensure that they are followed through. You might be able to work, maintain the processes that work for your organization, ensure that you train people to understand those processes so that those processes are not compromised going forward because you are not there. Why, why else should we have mentorship or why any other, another purpose for mentorship is that you need to have men and women who will continue legacies, who will continue the practices that have worked. So you need to maintain the legacies. And also, you need to raise a platform where young people can glean, can learn from the knowledge of the old, and also it will provide a platform for transgenerational impact. That is, from one generation to, to another, the knowledge, the understanding is passed on through mentorship. Now, not all mentorship is formal, as we will see uh, in, the, in the next outline, but there must be a consciousness and intention to ensure that we bridge knowledge gap, we maintain certain ordinances, especially godly ordinances. We have people who can continue the legacies that we have started. And we also ensure that there is an opportunity for people to learn, gain, glean knowledge, glean understanding, and have impact from one generation to another. What else? There are certain mistakes to be avoided in mentorship. So remember, we're talking about purpose of mentorship and common mistakes. Number one mistake is that the mentor or the mentor are not, are not really intentional about the process. You know, you don't just turn time to mentorship. You go into mentorship because you want to, you've made up your mind to, you know what you want to get out of it. And you follow the path, you follow the process. There must be an intention on the part of the mentor to impart knowledge. There must be an intention on the part of the mentee to receive knowledge and to imbibe it. So there must be an intentionality about the process. Another common mistake is that the, mentor, the mentee becomes egocentric. He thinks he knows more than the mentor, so he's not really paying attention. Oh, what does this person have to teach me? Oh, he can't even speak good English, but he has knowledge. So as a mentee, please don't become egocentric. Don't think too highly of yourself. You need that mentor to help you. Another common mistake is that Mentee thinks mentorship is slavery in disguise. Remember, mentorship is intentional. So you need time. You need commitment. If you begin to begrudge the time that you spend with your mentor and you think that he's just wasting your time or, you know, using you and, you know, you become resentful of the amount of sacrifice that you're making, you're making a mistake because your mentor too is making sacrifice to be able to teach you, to be able to, you know, impart knowledge onto you. So 
Yeah, another common mistake is that mentees uh, begin to think that you know this process is not worth it. It's taking too much time. They begin to they become resentful. Number four mistake is that mentor, mentor and mentee do not have boundaries. They become too familiar with each other. They become informal. They, they, they don't respect each other's space. You just show up in their place at any time. You call them at any time. You speak to them any time, any, anyhow. You don't really take what they're saying seriously or you dismiss their questions. Then that's, that's becoming too familiar. A mentor is not a friend. There's something that you want to gain out of that relationship that's going to impact your future. So if they are too familiar, then they may not get the best out of that relationship. Another uh, mistake, this is on the part of mentors, that sometimes they don't fully open up to their mentees. They don't reveal everything. They hide some information. Because if I teach this person, if I show this person how to do things, he may now surpass me in a place of work. Or he may surpass me in ministry. No. Pour out yourself to your mentees. And they too will pour themselves to their mentees in future. So don't hold back. Don't withhold information from your mentees. Teach them fully. All right. So in this in this first outline, we looked at the purpose and the of uh, mentorship and the common mistakes. We'll now go to the second outline, which talks about accessing mentors. So how do we get a mentor? How do we access a mentor? Do we choose a mentor, or does the mentor choose us? That's what we want to find out in this second outline. How do we get a mentor? How do we access a mentor? Ideally, how do we access a mentor? Mentoring is intentional. We said that earlier. The mentor carefully and prayerfully chooses whom to mentor. That is the ideal way. However, in this day, and it's the more common way is that mentees carefully look for mentors. They look for people that they want to mentor them. Maybe you've noticed something in their character or their experience or, you know, the way they carry themselves or their situation in life, you say, oh, I want to learn from this person. I want to be like that person. In other words, accessing a mentor can go either way. The mentor can, you know, invite, look for, prayerfully look for mentees and invite them and draw them close. Or the mentee can go out and reach out to potential mentors and ask them formally to, uh, for them to, to mentor, to mentor them. So how do we know the right kind of mentor? It's important. You need to know what you need mentorship for. For some, it's professional. So if, for instance, you are a lawyer, you need a mentor in that field, there's no point going to a medical doctor if you want to be mentored as a professional. So look for legal people who have made an impact, whose style, whose practice you admire read about them, learn about them, and you know, access them, reach out to them, and ask them to be your mentor. So you need to know the right kind of mentor, why you need a mentor, in what area of your life you need a mentor. You can also be mentored by proxy. Not all mentors know their mentees. There are many people who maybe read the books of a certain person that they admire, and they follow them, they read about them, they read their blogs, they read their biographies. A lot of people, you know, look up to Steve Jobs, he's late, but there are people who almost go by the, his philosophy. They look at John Maxwell, they want to read about him, read his book. So you can actually be mentored by proxy. In other words, your mentor doesn't even know that you exist, or you are learning from him or for her. So you can learn from books, from tapes, and from other materials. Now, there are some steps that you can use as a yardstick to selecting your mentor. And we're going to look at those steps on the next slide. So what are those steps that you, know, you need to take and use as a yardstick to find a mentor for yourself? First, you need to understand yourself and your purpose in life. Like I illustrated earlier, why do you need a mentor? And in what area do you need a mentor? You need to understand that. You must also understand the field of expertise in which you want to function and search for the individual with a proven record in that area. Is it, even if it's in ministry, are you looking for to be mentored by a prophet or a teacher or an evangelist or a pastor? Are you looking for, you must know the particular field of expertise and then go after people like that. Many people in this ministry see uh, Pastor Adebo as their mentor. You may not have the chance to have a face-to-face -face with him, 
but there are books, there are tips, there are programs that you can watch, that you can, you know, learn about him and watch his lifestyle and see what you can copy from, from such. In all mentorship relationship, godly behavior and godly lifestyle is important. So if you're looking for mentors, even in the secular, even if you're in your place of work, make sure that your mentor is someone who fears God. Otherwise, you might also copy their bad habits, their flamboyance or their rudeness or their aggressive behavior. Yes, they may be smart, they may be brilliant. But if there are any of those abrasive or aggressive type of people, you don't want to copy such behavior. So look for a behavior, a godly lifestyle yeah, when you're choosing a mentor, even for secular purposes. It's important to make the mentorship process official, especially if you're not being mentored by proxy. Like the one that you said that, you know, the person doesn't know you, but you admire him or her so much that you're reading about him, you're reading their works. That's a different one. But where you want a one-on-one -on -one physical interaction with your mentor, please make the process official. Approach the person, ensure that the person knows the reason why you're seeking their relationship. They know that you're their mentee and you know them as mentor. That's the way to ensure that communication is right and that you respect each other's boundaries. If there's no formal process, you may overstep. So formalize the mentorship process if it's a one-on-one -on -one physical mentorship. It's also important to ensure that your mentor is someone who will be available to guide you to your goal. If your mentor is too busy, so important, political figure, whatever is going from place to place, you may never have that one-on-one -on -one where you can ask questions and, uh, and be truly guided. So ensure that that person accepts. That's why it's also important to more formalize it. Make sure the person accepts to be your mentor because he then he or she will have out time to mentor you, to interact with you. So what have we said today about mentorship? One, that a mentor is a trusted counselor. And I'm going, I'm going to keep stressing that word, trusted. Mentorship, especially for Christians, is a, is a ministry. You've seen example, Paul and Timothy, Paul and Silas, uh, Elijah and Elisha, Jethro and uh, Moses. There are many examples in the Bible. So the man, ministry of a mentor is an active office of someone who is intentionally committed to raising those who aspire to be guided by them into becoming whom God has wired them to be in life, committed to making the next generation better, to equipping them to be better. We can maximize mentorship without abusing it. So it's important that we do not abuse mentorship. It's important to know that one, a mentorship relationship is not friendship. So the liberties you can take with your friend, you cannot take with your mentor or mentee. You need to respect each other's boundaries. That's why it's important where possible to formalize the relationship. The mentee must not become irresponsible in handling certain aspects of his or her life in the process of mentorship. If you have an appointment with your mentor, keep that appointment. Don't barge into your mentor's office or home or you know, send nonsensical messages to them by WhatsApp or by text, no. Maintain that relationship, respect the boundaries, and don't become irresponsible. So I pray that from now on, we'll under, we, I hope that through this lesson and much more, we've understood what mentorship is. We'll be better mentors and better mentees in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you for this special gift that you've given us, even in the body of Christ, this, the ministry of mentorship. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will not abuse the process but we will benefit from it and it will make us better individuals, better professionals, and better believers. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.